Well, good morning and welcome to the first uh, plenary of the AISB 50. I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce Professor Susan Stepney, who's a professor of computer science at the University of York and director of the York Centre for Complex Systems. But she has, she tells me, quite an unconventional route um, to this position. She tells me that she's an, uh, originally a theoretical astrophysicist, which is no um, easy thing to say in the morning for me at least, in the 1980s. Uh, and later decided that an industrial career offered more financial stability, and she took it the opportunity to eat, which doesn't come After that, she worked for 18 years in industry as a research student, first at TEC Marconi Thompson, working on the first transporter system, transmitter system, uh, and then to Cambridge to work as a consultant with Logica, uh, working on formal methods, including using Z to specify and prove security properties of financial smart card products. Uh, then in 2002, the opportunity arose to move back into the academia, and specifically computer science, and she used this chance to change focus, looking at unconventional computing and complex systems. She has research interests in artificial life, artificial chemistry, open-ended evolution, and computing with unconventional devices, from quantum computers to slime molds, and that is exactly where this brings us this morning, because she's going to be talking to us about what it means to use unconventional materials such as slime molds to do computation. So, I'll pass it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe a slight amount of false advertising in the title here. I will mention slime molds, but only as one particular example of, of computation. In fact, if I say to you, computer, you probably think of one of these kind of things, all the way maybe from a smartphone, a standard desktop machine, um, to some kind of mainframe. Uh, some of the slightly greyer members of the audience might think of something more like this, which is the kind of uh, thing that I was using a while back. Probably nobody's quite grey enough to think of something like this, but that's also a fairly traditional kind of computer. Um, but do you think of something like this when someone says computer? So we have here, you know, everything from slime molds to black holes with weird stuff in between. Um, these are the kind of things that people nowadays are trying to think of as ways of doing computation where it's actually physically embodied in the uh, underlying substrate in a much closer way than we think of with traditional computers. However, even though this looks fairly weird, you shouldn't think, uh, you shouldn't be surprised that there's quite weird stuff used in computation. After all, we've been using weird stuff to do computation for a long time now. Um, some of the earliest computers um, are you know, physically embodied in rocks or, and gears and so on. Now, they're not universal computers. They've got fairly limited things that they can compute, maybe calculate, maybe in some cases simply observe. But in some sense, these are all um, doing some form of computation. So that actually then leads on to the question, what actually, what is a computer? Uh, what does it mean to say that some kind of physical system is doing computation rather than actually just doing its own thing, acting under the laws of physics and doing whatever uh, uh, physics does? I mean, there are some people who will try and claim that everything is computing at least itself and that the entire universe is just a big computer computing itself. Uh, but actually, if you go to that extreme of a definition... Uh, you end up not actually being very helpful because if everything is a computer, then it doesn't really help you to understand what a computer is. So um, we're trying to um, distinguish computation from just doing its own thing. In other words, when does a physical system compute? So in order to talk about this and to get to slime moulds eventually, I'm going to go through three things. I, first of all, I'm going to define what science is, then I'm going to define what engineering is, and then I'm going to define what computing is. So, of course, we may be here some time in order to go through all that. Um, but with the science, we see how a physical system, um, we, uh, we use an abstract model to capture a physical system. Then with engineering, it's the other way around. We're going to instantiate an abstract model with a physical system, and then computing will uh, glue these ideas together. So let's start with science. Um, we've got a physical system, the real stuff in the real world that you can kick. You know, that, that, that's the, uh, we're in that uh, particular domain. And then we have an abstract model in a completely different domain. Uh, that's our model of the physical system. So we represent the physical system in an abstract model. Now, clearly, that's a, a theory-dependent representation. 
that representation and that model depends on what we want to understand about the system. But then an abstract model can also be instantiated in a physical system. Um, so here, for example, we have a very simple uh, idea of a pendulum, a real physical pendulum, and then our abstract model uh, with uh, uh, sort of uh, Newtonian mechanics working out uh, the forces on it, uh, eventually coming to the mangled equation of motion. Sorry, I tested that this worked. Um, uh, clearly, in this particular case, it didn't. I blame Macintoshes. Um, I tested it on a PC. Sorry. <laughs> Hate computers. That's, uh, um, right. So anyway, that should be um, the obvious um, uh, equation of motion. Uh, there. So that's the idea. We have a physical reality. We have an abstract model that's been derived from uh, via a theory of, uh, in this case, forces to give us an ab abstract model of how it works. And now potentially we can instantiate that abstract model back in a physical system. So if we have any system that obeys this abstract model, we could potentially instantiate it uh, as, a, as, a, as a pendulum. So let's get on to the def definition of science here. So let's start with some physical system. As, um, in this case, let's just have some ice with a heat source on it. Then time will go by and it will evolve under physical laws. Um, and as time goes by, um, it evolves under this physical law. The, so the physical system P evolves under the law H of P and produces... Sorry, I'm pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> um, produces... Um, some time later, in this case, water. So we have the physical system and doing whatever it does. Now, of, of course, you have got to be a little careful here. I, I've written this as if it's a model, but I'm not thinking here of it as a model. This is the actual physical reality. But we can't talk about the physical reality other than via a model. Um, so you get a little bit confused sometimes. Okay, so what we, what we do when we do science is we look at these physical systems and we represent them in, a, in a, the different abstract domain as some kind of model. So I've now got my model of my physical system here. And then what I can say is I can infer under my theory of how my physical system works what the later state of that uh, model is going to be. But of course I can also actually represent the real after state of my physical system. So the difference here is that that's m dashed of p because it's the after state of the model and this is m of p dashed because it's the after state, it's the, the state of the after physical system. And the whole interesting question is, does my theory, what's the gap between those two parts of the system? My theory, my, my theoretical route's going that way and the physical route going that way, do, do I get the same answer? And science is all about trying to get the same answer. So, for example, a good theory makes that epsilon small enough. And small enough, sufficiently small for the purposes of whatever it is we're doing the science for. They're not, they're not necessarily going to be equal, but they can be sufficiently small. So in the, the key point here is that if epsilon is too large, what we have to do is change the theory. Reality trumps theory in science. It's reality is telling us what's actually happening. Our theory is trying to um, get an understanding of what's really happening. The theory, of course, is a model of this reality. And an important point about models is that they're always approximations. There's that famous statement, all models are wrong, some models are useful. Um, they're always approximations, and those approximations will break down when you're outside the domain of applicability. But with inside that domain of applicability, then what you want is a good model. You want one where that epsilon is small. And then, once you've got a good theory, once you've made that gap small, you can have prediction. You don't need to do the physical reality check each time in order to infer what's actually going to happen. But for that to be the case you do need a good model. So in other words, this is our, a good scientific theory. We've got a well-characterized physical system. These two models are close enough for our purposes, and that means that we can go around the loop the other way. We can predict the final state, and in fact, we don't need to actually do the experiment once we've got a good physical theory. 
So here what I'm doing is I'm defining prediction to mean that I use that abstract dynamics, that inference at the abstract level in the abstract domain, on a well-characterized physical system, in other words, one about which I have a good theory, then I can use that to infer the physical dynamics, i.e. what the system will do in reality. And of course, this is all subject to some representation, some underlying theory. Okay, all well and good. So that's science done. Now we can move on to engineering. I'm kind of summarizing a bit. There's a, more to it than that, obviously. But that's <coughs> good enough for what we want to do today. So technology or engineering, we, we again have a physical system, but now I've called it a physical artifact because it's something that we're wanting to build. And we have an engineering model. This is the, um, again, in the abstract domain, the model of whatever it is that we're talking about. And the physical artifact is represented by the engineering model, and the engineering model is instantiated in the physical artifact. So... key difference is we start in a different place. So recall with the science, we started with the physical system. Now we're starting with the model. We're starting with an idea, a concept. This is what I want the world to be like. So that's um, another kind of def distinction between science and engineering. Science is a description of the world as it is. Engineering is trying to make the world to be what we want it to be. So... I have my model of what I want, and I can infer under my um, well-understood theory now what my final system is going to be. And I said well-understood theory because before doing <coughs> engineering, we need some form of science to know how the system uh, behaves. And that, that doesn't have to be um, a formal theory. It can be a kind of phen phenomenological theory. That's also a very difficult word to say, phenomenological. Um, uh, but we have to understand uh, how, the, how the physical systems work to some degree. So I can infer what I want. So this is, this is kind of like my specification of, of how I want my system to be. And then I can instantiate it in some physical artifact. And now this instantiation relation, I kind of snuck it into the prediction relation a little while ago. But it's a much harder thing than the modeling, the representation relation that goes the other way. Uh, actually... Representation modelling is pretty hard, but instantiation is much harder. I can imagine stuff that I cannot physically instantiate. I very easily imagine things I can't physically instantiate. So this is definitely, this, this relation is certainly not, uh, not total. There are things up here that can't be instantiated. But let's assume that we can. So I can instantiate my physical system, and then over time that physical system will behave as physical systems do and have its final state... Um, and then again, I can do the same thing. I can represent that final state back up here as my um, model of my final physical system. And again, the question is about the gap between those two. So um, again, I want the gap to be small because I want my inferred final state and my actual um, final state to be close enough for my purposes. So engineering is about making a good instantiation, making epsilon small, among other things, of course. But here, again, the difference is if epsilon is too big, it's the physical system that needs to be changed because we've started from the abstract model. So unlike science, where if epsilon is big, you change the theory, in engineering, if epsilon is too big, you change the implementation because your specification was what you actually wanted. So the desired model trumps reality in engineering. But again, I have to say that that theory is always just a model of reality. It's, um, it's an approximation. It has a domain of um, uh, validity. And in engineering, that domain of validity is extremely important. No matter how good your model is, if you put a truck that's much too heavy on the bridge, it will collapse. And if your model was... Um, uh, your implementation was slightly wrong. That was a picture of the Millennium Bridge I had, and people walk over it. And originally, when people walked over it, it wobbled um, because the design was wrong. So, but also, <coughs> a good instantiation, a well-engineered system, allows it to be used without needing a theory check every time. 
So you don't have to, as you walk up to a bridge and want to walk over it, have to calculate to check that the bridge will actually um, hold your weight. You're reasonably confident that you walk over it, it's a well-engineered system, it's going to work fine, as long as you're within the domain where the approximations hold. So again, we have a similar uh, diagram, a well-engineered technology, we have a specification, we know what we want the system to do, we instantiate it, we see what happens, we represent it back up, and if it's well engineered, these things are close together, close enough for what we want, and therefore I don't need to do the inference every time I use the engineered system. Okay, so that's engineering. But I've been using this word infer a lot, this abstract dynamics, this inference in the abstract domain of the, from the before to the after <coughs> system. <coughs> Who or what is doing that inferring in the abstract domain? Well, it's a long, complicated calculation or computation. Um, simpler systems, we can do it with pencil and paper. But of course, with more complicated systems, we want some help to do this inference, and we want to use a computer. <coughs> so how does a computer fit into this idea? So let's go through the process again. So, this is a uh, kind of form of engineering again. We have a computer which is a, a physical artifact that is engineered, and we have some computation, some abstract thing um, that, that we want. And the computer <coughs> represents the, is represented by the computation, and the computation is instantiated in the computer. Now clearly when I say it's a physical device, it is a physical device, um, but it, it's been loaded with some software, but once the software is in the computer, it's still just a physical device. The only thing that exists in the physical world is physical stuff, and the information that's the, um, that's the program or whatever is instantiated um, in the highly engineered uh, initial physical state of the system. So computing, I start with some abstract model. This is the computation that I want to do. And that's the, at the abstract level, that is the computation going on, and there's my uh, results, my after state coming out. So how I do that computation, I program the computer, I encode the input in the physical device, I've got a physical device that's set up in the right state to do the computation, and I let time go by, and our, uh, physics happens, and uh, after a while, my computer is in a new state, hopefully, um, with, in the resulting state. I <coughs> decode the output from that. And of course, what I want is for the output from my computer to be sufficiently close to the answer to the computation that I actually want. So this is exactly the same diagram as the engineering diagram. I haven't, I haven't made anything different except change the pictures on it and some of the words. So with computing, uh, a good instantiation um, of uh, a good physical system uh, makes that epsilon small enough um, for our purposes. And if epsilon is too large, we need to change the physical system. In other words, we need to um, change probably the initial state. The physical system, remember, has got the uh, computer program loaded into it, so we might need to debug the program that's loaded into it, i.e. debug the initial state of the computation and the commands that it's going to follow. But of course, a theory is a model of reality, so the, the theory that we're using to do the computation, even in a classical computer, can break down outside the um, model's valid domain. It always uh, amuses me when people say that a, um, a PC is um, an implementation of a Turing machine because Turing machines don't do out of memory, PCs do. PCs are finite. We, don't, we can't implement Turing machines, which is my answer when people say, all this weird stuff that you're talking about, you can't implement that, and I say, well, you can't implement a Turing machine, so we're even, um, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but the point here now is that the well-instantiated computer allows us not to have to do this computation check every time the system is used, as long as it's used in the domain of approximation. In other words, this diagram now, once we've debugged our program and everything and these two are the same, I can 
remove the inference. And so what I've got is my answer given to me through a representation and a time evolution of a physical device and uh, a, a reading of the output. In other words, I've done the computation with a physical device. So that's how a physical device can compute. So my definition here in this point is computation is the use of this physical dynamics of the physical system, of a well-engineered physical system, to predict the abstract dynamic C, in other words, to predict the answer of the computation I wanted to do. So that's, that's what computation is, is the use of a physical device, subject to some encoding and theory and all that kind of stuff. For unconventional computing, slime mold and their ilk, that definition does not say anything about the nature of that physical device. You might be, have been assuming, because I drew little pictures of PCs, that it had to be this kind of computer, but that definition does not put any constraints on the physical device. As long as the physical device can be engineered such that it can be used to predict the outcome of your um, abstract uh, calculation, then it's a computer. So it doesn't have to be made of silicon, doesn't have to be a conventional computer. And, and so we use this definition to understand what it means for an unconventional physical system to compute. So now we have a picture of slime molds, but um, slime mold is a physical system. And I'm going to claim that in some instances it might be a computer. So this physical system is well engineered. You see, it's not just a random slime mold, but there's little bits of, um, usually it's oat flakes, but on here it looks like tiny pieces of pizza, but maybe it's oat flakes, I don't know. So there's a kind of a food source. So it's not just slime mold, it's slime mold in an engineered system that has been set up with an initial condition to specify which particular computation to do. And that represents some computation, what, but what computation? That's, that's, that's the question. What kind of computation is going on here? But whatever it is, that computation is then instantiated in this physical system. And this is how we use the f unconventional substrates to do computation exactly the same way as we'd use a PC. So um, I have my abstract computation I want to do, I, which is this inference here. I program it into the initial state of some unconventional physical device. Here it's a maze solving um, slime mold. Um, so there's a particular shape of maze, my initial state of my slime mold. Time goes by, slime mold physics happens, and there's a, an answer that comes out the end. I then output, I decode the output into my answer. And of course, again, the question is, I want epsilon to be small so that I can trust this to be the answer to my computation. So it's all about encoding physics, decoding, and keeping epsilon small. So let's go through a couple of examples about how this might work. So again, for the uh, slightly grayer people in the audience, here's a nice example of a, um, a, an unconventional co computer. Who knows what a slide rule is? Oh, many more than when I say this to my students. <laughs> Who knows how to use a slide rule? Wow, I'm impressed. I'm not going to ask you to do it. Right, anyway, right. <coughs> For the rest of you, this is a really strange device that you can use to multiply numbers together and other stuff as well. I actually used this as a, while I was an undergraduate. So the calculation you want to do, the computation you want to do, is multiplication. So it's not a universal computer. It can do multiplication, uh, and that's about it. The underlying physical theory is how sticks um, act when you put them end to end. In other words, if I've got a stick of uh, a particular length and I've put another stick of a particular length on the end, what's the total length of the stick? Well, it's just the addition of those two lengths. There's nothing weird happens when you put sticks together. The instantiation, the encoding of my computation is that the abstract numbers are instantiated as physical lengths along these wooden sticks. So here we've got one, we've got two, we've got three. So it's, the stick has got nice little numbers on it so that you can see, you can measure off. It's just a, but it's just a measuring rule. In the real world, you join the lengths together. 
So here I've got one and a half, so that's the length of one and a half. I add on the length of two, and then I can read the answer off, which is three. So one and a half plus two doesn't equal three, but one and a half times two does equal three, because as you will notice, these are logarithmic scales. So I'm doing addition, but because they're logarithmic scales, the computation is multiplication. And the output, I just read off the total length, I read off three. You can do more complicated calculations with it than one and a half times two. It's really quite useful. But that's an example of an unconventional com computer within, within this model, how I'm, how I'm doing the computation by instantiating it in a physical device, encoding the input, doing the manipulation, which is sliding the thing and um, making, putting the two lengths together and then reading off the resulting output. So back to slime molds. Here we have the um, way the calculation is done. In this particular case, the calculation that we want to do is to solve the maze, to find the route, the shortest route, from the uh, input to the output. So the underlying theory now is how slime molds behave in the presence of food. And the theory says that they minimise the distance. So slime molds are these amazing... Um, single-celled creatures in this particular case, but they're single-celled but very large. They've got multiple nuclei in them. And so it is a single organism uh, sitting here, and it kind of contracts down to a shortest distance, but it keeps one end of itself um, on uh, one lot of food and the other end on the other lot of food. And if you put the food at the input and output, it contracts down to a shortest path. So that's the theory Notice I was waving my hands because that's kind of the level of the theory for uh, how slime molds work. The instantiation, I, get, I make a, a maze and I get some dried slime mold and chop it up and put it over the maze and stick some water on it and slime molds are amazing. What happens just then is that it all reconstitutes itself into a single organism. So I start off with, a, with one slime mold um, over the entire maze. And then it kind of wakes up and starts doing its slime moldy stuff and contracting, and so as time goes by, you see at the end there we've got a slime mould going from the uh, beginning to the end. So that's the real world, slime mould contracts, and then the output is reading off the path taken by the slime mould. And so that's what I mean for when I say the slime mould is computing that path. Within the model, I've instantiated a system, physics has happened, and I've read off the output, and I'm happy that the underlying theory in engineering is sufficiently good, that my epsilon is sufficiently small, that that is the correct output for the computation. That's what I mean for it to be doing a computation. But really, whether or not it's a computation is all about epsilon, all about making that gap small enough. So my theory has to be good. Do slime molds really find the shortest path? Well, as I said, it was a bit hand wavy. <coughs> Um, and actually, of course, they don't because um, they find a pretty good short path and when your maze is small enough, that will be the shortest path, but they don't, if you, had, if you made this maze, you know, several kilometres across and had a, one enormous slime mold over it, no, it wouldn't find the shortest path. There were precision issues as well. Remember I said epsilon had to be small enough for your purpose. We're very used to digital computers to being able to make that epsilon zero uh, because, it's, because it's a digital system. As soon as you go to analog systems like slide rules, um, then you have precision issues. Um, slide rule, you can usually read the scale to two, three significant uh, digits um, if, you, if, you're, if you're taking care. And of course those can, um, as you, if you do multiple computations, one after the other, the errors can uh, increase. Actually, it's really useful using a slide rule so that you can only give three digits uh, in your answer. Um, um, I, I really hate those things where somebody has put in two numbers known to uh, two or three significant figures, uh, does some calculation with them, reads off the ten uh, figures that come out the calculator at the end and writes that down as if it's the answer. I always say you, you've written the answer down to ten insignificant digits at that point. You can't do that with a slide rule. The theory domain, as I said, uh, it's a, the theory is a model of reality and it has a domain of applicability. 
Um, there are scaling issues, so do big slime molds follow the same theory? Well, no, no, they don't. Uh, the theory is only an approximation that works in the small case. Um, but, you know, calculators, um, computers don't do it either. Um, desktop calculator, um, put in two and just hit the cube button lots of times. First of all, after one, two, three, four times hitting the uh, cube button, you've lost precision. And then hit it another three times, you've lost, uh, you're out of memory. Uh, it can't display a number that big. You know, obviously other systems, you can display larger numbers and so on, but eventually when the number that you're trying to display is bigger than the memory capacity of the uh, m uh, machine in whatever representation you've got, it can't, it can't do it. Um, and it can happen quite quickly. So the, the, you've got to make sure you're within the domain of applicability of your theory. And there's lots of hidden computation that can happen, particularly in the um, uh, encoding and decoding steps. When, often when people uh, look at unconventional computation, they only look at that bottom physical um, evolution step, and they ignore the encoding and decoding steps, which are also there, and can have computation in preparing the inputs and interpreting the outputs. So with the slide rule, those of you who've used slide rules will know when I said that that was one and a half times two, it was also 15 times two, it was also 15 times 10, two times 10 to the minus four. It was lots and lots of things. And you actually have to do some extra calculation, um, which is to get the decimal point in the right place, which is another advantage of slide rules because it makes you think about the calculation you're doing. Definitely feeling old at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but also reading out the slime molds path. Okay, uh, I said that that's the output um, looking at that, you can see the slime molds path. That's actually a non-trivial exercise um, to uh, find that path. You might need some kind of vision system. You might need something where you pour onto the slime mold so that it ma ma makes a mark or something like that. But it's a non-trivial exercise to actually extract the path from that. So there's lots of potential hidden computations and so on going on there. So... Can a slime mold compute? Well, I've sort of talked about various things. There's a, there's a law that says that if any newspaper headline is written as a question, then the answer is always no. But in this case, I'm going to say, yeah, OK, a slime mold can compute, but not very well. <clears throat> it can only do small computations, so it can't do the really big ones because the theory isn't really there yet. But yet, yeah, maybe as we get better theories, we'll understand the substrates better. We'll be able to engineer them better to do more interesting computations. But what would we need, therefore, using this model of what computation is, what do we need for production scale slime mold or other unconventional computing? <coughs> In other words, what do we need, to come back to the theme of the, the, the conference, what do we need for production scale embodied computing rather than um, just physics happening. Well, we need a well-characterized substrate. We need, to, we need a good science of the stuff we're using. So with um, a slime mold here, we need to understand how the slime mold works. Don't try and read what this says. This is just a bit of complicated maths I took off the web. It's nothing to do with slime molds. Okay? But we need something to tell us how slime molds uh, work, including the domain of applicability. When is this um, characterization applicable and when is it not? So the size of the system, the temperature maybe, because slime molds behave differently at different temperatures. Well, computers behave differently at different temperatures. Back when I was uh, in industry working uh, on formal methods and trying to prove software correctness, I remember having a conversation with somebody who was in charge of safety of a nuclear power station who said to me, I will take your proof, formal proof of correctness of safety seriously when you can prove it will work when the computer's dunked in liquid sodium. Okay, I think that's outside the domain of applicability of the computer and therefore of my proof. So we need to um, know that. And substrate theories, we have quite a lot of well-developed ones. One of the good things about classical uh, PCs is we've got a uh, good theory of solid state transistors, we kind of know how they work. Classical mechanics we know about, quantum mechanics, extremely good theory of quantum mechanics. Um, 
pretty good theory of reaction diffusion chemistry, which is another substrate that people use to do uh, unconventional computing. We got a lot of phenomenological theories, most, mostly all of biology. Sorry if there are any biologists in the audience, but being an ex-physicist, um, they're phenomenological theories. Um, and the problem with those is extrapolation and scaling issues. You've got a really good theory of how the system works at this particular scale, but have you got a good theory? If I made it 10 times, 100 times, a million times bigger, would your theory still hold? And then we have naive theories, and um, unfortunately these are the ones that are bound in lots of uh, unconventional computation, which are basically theories that are wrong. They're approximations, so shortest path theories, <coughs> So, for example, people will talk about using soap bubble uh, computers to find uh, minimal Steiner trees because, of course, soap bubbles find a minimum length. No, they don't. They find a stationary length. It's the principle of stationary action that's being used, not the principle of minimum action. And um, once your soap bubbles get big enough, they get trapped in local optima, just like anything else. And, in fact, even worse than approximate ones are the counterfactual theories uh, ones where I'll b I'm going to build an unconventional computer using Newtonian mechanics and require speeds to be unbounded for uh, this computer to work. Slight problem there. Newtonian mechanics is wrong. Uh, it's not the right theory, particularly when speeds get high. Or I will assume that matter is continuous, not discrete, so that I can continually uh, chop it up into smaller and smaller pieces. So you need a good substrate theory, and it needs to be uh, applicable in the domain that you're using it. You then need a well-engineered instantiation of that theory. If your engineering is bad, then um, you, you're not going to, uh, no matter how good your theory is, you're still going to have problems. Um, so what do we need for engineering these? We need to be able to compose those scientific theories because we're going to have multiple components. Because we're going to have multiple kinds of components, we're going to be sticking different kinds of stuff together, each with their own individual theories. We're going to have interconnections between those components, so we're going to need a theory of the interconnection as well. And then, uh, once we've done that, then comes the exciting bit of how do we control the computation, how do we program it, we need a theory of uh, underlying that as well. And the engineering issues, of course, scaling is important in engineering. We need to be able to... Uh, especially if we've got a phenomenological theory, we need to be able to interpolate between the points where we've got uh, results, um, which maybe uh, we can do relatively straightforwardly, but we need to be able to extrapolate. And the point about a phenomenological theory is you can't extrapolate it. You only know what it is in that domain. You have no idea what it's going to do in bigger domains. The model breaks down. Remember, all models are approximations, and they will break down outside these areas. But you need those two things, a good theory and good engineering, to get that sufficiently small epsilon such that you can be saying that you're doing computation. I don't need to do this because I can get rid of that because I know what's going on. So in this particular case, it's a small system. I'm happy I know how it works, that I get a good enough approximation to the shortest path that I can be happy it's doing computation. But if, we don't, but if we have an insufficiently small epsilon, we don't have a well-characterized substrate, maybe, then <coughs> when we're fiddling about with the system, we're not doing computation, we're doing science to try and make that epsilon smaller to understand <coughs> the system better. And if we don't have a well-engineered system, <coughs> we're not doing computation, we're doing engineering in order to try and make that epsilon smaller. So when we're fiddling around with stuff, there are three things we can be doing. We can be doing science, we can be doing engineering, we can be doing computation. You have to keep it clear which one you're doing. A lot of unconventional com computing claims to be doing computation. It's probably actually doing a little bit of engineering and maybe some science. What I haven't even mentioned is, and we also need a natural fit to the problem. So, for example, even if I was quite happy that a slime mob was doing computation, I probably wouldn't want it to calculate my tax return. There are, different, there are different problems that different kinds of computation are better for. So this natural fit, <coughs> in other words, what we want, given the abstract dynamics, which is our specification of what we want to do, we need a physical dynamics that's a good fit to it, or what people call it a small semantic gap between the, between the two. And actually, 
conventional computers, the semantic gap is huge, it's enormous. And that's why we have all these problems with software engineering. We're trying to crunch down our abstract uh, ideas of what we want to do uh, down into Boolean logic through many, 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 many layers of um, refinement and virtual, le virtual machines and so on and so on. So as I call it, we, we end up torturing silicon to implement Boolean logic, and then we torture the abstract computation to be uh, written in terms of Boolean logic. Other substrates, potentially, this is the big advantage and why people are interested in it, other substrates, um, other embodiments of computation can have a much smaller semantic gap. So the whole um, uh, rationale for analog computers, the idea is that the semantic gap between the computation wanted and what the system is doing is very, very small. And other un unconventional approaches, hopefully, uh, the same. And once we've got that small semantic gap, good engineering, good theory so we can do computation, that's when we get to the future, and hopefully we can use all these embodied ideas to do really cool stuff. Um, uh, nanobots uh, cleaning cholesterol out of arteries, um, uh, engineered cells growing skyscrapers, and various other stuff, and presumably something to do with intelligence as well. And that's where I'd like to leave that and just acknowledge my co-authors uh, on the paper, and if you want to find out more about what I've been talking about, it's up on the archive here. Thank you.